Welcome to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. This is the big conversation. It's the great debate, but it can only be a debate if you join in. That's why, above all, I need your telephone calls on 44208-601-4555. You call us, we'll call you back, establish a clear line, and remember, if you get on the television with me, the volume on your television has to be down at zero, or I'll have to move swiftly on. You can SMS the show on 4478 or you can email me at comment at presstv.co.uk. And as always, at this time of the week, a big welcome to listeners of London's colourful radio, based in London, but spreading the colour throughout the land. And the listeners on colourful radio should note that the details above, the phone numbers and so on, are for this show only. Two subjects tonight, but they could hardly be of greater moment. The world, or most of it, is rejoicing in the deal between Iran and the permanent five plus one on the nuclear question. Sanctions are being lifted and the people of Iran freed from the yoke of absolutely unjustified sanctions which have made their lives, many of them, a misery over these last years, all on the pretext that Iran might be preparing to build a nuclear bomb, even though there is absolutely no evidence at all that it ever sought to do so, even though it is theologically precluded from doing so, and even though one of the one countries in the world where they are not celebrating the deal, what they call Israel, has hundreds of nuclear warheads in secret subject to no treaty, inspected by no one, not a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty or the IAEA and never in a million years ready to allow outsiders to inspect their nuclear site. All very different from Iran, of course, which has regular inspections and has now agreed a new schema which will allow this issue to be put to rest. What does it mean for world peace? Why has it happened? Why have Britain and America, just to take two, though you could take several more, who just a few weeks ago were ready to go to war with Syria and by extension Iran, have now made this peace deal? Will it last? Will its two deadly opponents? Now imagine this unholy alliance. The medieval, obscurantist, primitive tyranny of Saudi Arabia and the settler state they call Israel. These are the only two countries in the world who reject the peace deal. But will they be able to scupper it? After all, one of them has traditionally a lot of political influence and power and the other has a lot of money. So we'll be asking. Why has it happened? What does it mean? And does it mean a new era of world peace? And as the United States very publicly shifts its emphasis from the Middle East region to the Asia Pacific and principally towards China facing the threat, as they consider it, of a resurgent China, soon to be the biggest economy in the world, just had a major conference setting the course for China's future over the next 10 years. What does the United States do? It flies B-52 bombers over disputed islands in the South China Sea. The Chinese Navy launched its only aircraft carrier and the two powers are now facing off in the South China Sea and in the Asia Pacific region generally. What should China be concerned about in the United States' new preoccupation 
with its region, its neighborhood. If I were China, I would tell the United States, which has just declared that it does not recognize China's new air defense borders that China has just announced, if I was China, I'd say, you better recognize it pretty quick or we'll be selling all the US dollars we hold. And we hold more US dollars than the US does itself. If I was China, I'd now be standing up tall, even though in a few years China will need no encouragement to do that. If I were China, I'd be doing it right now. But I'd like to hear your point of view because these are, of course, only mine. They are not necessarily the views of anyone else. They are certainly not views that anyone has bullied or bribed me into holding. They may be right, they may be wrong, but they are my views. And if you have different views, then your call, SMS or email is all the more valuable. And we'll be put to the front of the queue. Abu Bakr's first up in Algeria. Abu Bakr, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yadavi. Uh, I'd like to praise you for the good work that we are doing. You know? Thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, about uh, Iran, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm happy for them. You know? I'm happy for Iran that they've given them six months to continue their nuclear testing. And I hope that uh, the, the sanctions and all those things will, will be lifted and Iran will be free forever. You know, And uh, about, uh, about the Iran nuclear issue, you know, this guy who is their neighbor and he is having so much nuclear and nobody is talking about that and all that. So I hope the, the uh, nuclear, uh, this thing, yeah. the international community will, will, will also look to that, see to that, so that they will inspect this, like how they are inspecting Iran's nuclear facility right now. Because I know Iran is doing it for peaceful purposes and they are doing it for different, uh, different purposes. Because they have the nuclear bombs and they have to be inspected because they are a threat to the world. You know, somebody who has got so many thousands of nuclear bombs and nobody knew how he is using it or whatever. Exactly. That person is a threat. And, know, and, so and pointed, Abu Bakr, pointed at Iran. Iran has never invaded anyone in centuries. Iran has never occupied anybody else's territory in centuries. Iran is a signatory to the NPT, admits inspection by the IAEA. Israel is guilty on all three of those counts. It regularly invades other countries. It regularly starts wars. It refuses to join the IAEA and the, sign the NPT. It is an international lawbreaker on a gargantuan scale. It has broken more United Nations Security Council resolutions than all of the countries of the world put together. But is Israel facing any sanctions? Is anyone punishing Israel for this international law breaking? No. Iran, which has broken no laws, no United Nations Security Council resolutions, allowed inspections, ready to sit down and agree with the world powers, a schema that will allow it to exercise its inalienable right to pursue the peaceful use of nuclear power has been endlessly punished and traduced. But, hallelujah, Abu Bakr, everything is beginning to change. Let's talk to Farida in London, in England, on this very subject. Farida, welcome to the show. Good evening, George. Good evening. Um, I have very mixed feelings about this so-called um, peace resolution. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, but I don't trust the United States of America, and I certainly don't expect Mr. Netanyahu to give any kind of positive angle mm -hmm. to this, this uh, process. I know that lifting of the sanctions is going to do Iran a lot of good in the long run. But honestly, the hypocrisy of the so-called superpowers who've all got nuclear weapons. Yes, that's, wh huh? that's why they're called superpowers. They're given a place permanently at the Security Council and a veto precisely because they have nuclear weapons. Well, George, 
George. Yes, go on. Can I say that it might not be a PC, but I really, dearly would like to see Iran pursuing the nuclear option. Okay, not immediately. Uh, we can um, sort of let the inspectors in. But how dare, how dare America and the other powers think that they have the right to interfere in Iran's policies? We, if we have the capability in Iran, I say we will go nuclear for as long as Israel is there and we perceive it as a threat to us. We have every right to have nuclear capabilities for whatever purpose we need them. No, well, Farida, I'm, uh, if you join the NPT, if you sign it, then you are agreeing that you will not proliferate nuclear weapons. And Iran has signed it. And it's solemn and binding. And Iran's word means something. The late Ayatollah Khomeini, followed by the current Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, have both issued fatwa that say that weapons of mass destruction are haram, are forbidden. Because by definition, they are weapons unlimited in space and time. In other words, when you use them, they are not just applicable to the place at which you fire them, but that they spread everywhere. And they don't just last for that particular moment in battle, they last in the case of nuclear weapons, forever, or as next to, as near to forever. So they are religiously precluded. Iran has taken a self-denying ordinance on this matter. But Iran now has the right to say, and we have to say, as you implicitly were saying, that how can we have a, a region where the only country which has nuclear weapons, what they call Israel, is actually still threatening the other countries, occupying some of them, and threatening devastating military consequences to a country, Iran, which doesn't have them. This is simply illogical. No man or woman in the world could make a logical argument in defense of that. Farida, thanks as always for the call. Here's Mark in my old stamping ground in Glasgow. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Mr. Galloway. Go ahead, sir. Okay, I was, I was just going to speak briefly about the China-Japanese situation that's happening at the moment. Yes. Uh, what's your opinion on it being all to do with maybe the currency and uh, the sort of trade wars, currency wars that have been going on for the, for the past year or so? Well, look, Japan, and, uh, as you well know, as a clever man, uh, Japan invaded China and carried out mass slaughter and seized a part of the territory of China and would have seized all of it if it could. And China has never forgotten the period of fascist barbarism inflicted upon its territory and its people by Japan when it was an imperialist power. It's certainly not going to allow Japan to hold on to Chinese territory. And why should it? And China will stand up for its rights. The real question is, why is the United States flying bombers over territory that China considers to be its? I mean, if China, if China flew bombers over Puerto Rico or over Hawaii or over Alaska, or any other piece of territory that the United States had rather unusually acquired, like California, for example, or parts of Arizona. Imagine if the Chinese Air Force was flying armed bombers over that territory. What would the United States' reaction be? What would the media in the rest of the world's reaction be? But you're right in this regard, Mark, that... What this is really all about is beginning to confront China. 
to try to put China somehow back in its box because the overarching foreign policy preoccupation of the United States of America from here on in will be the resurgence of people's China as a society, as an economy, as a model, as an investor in the world, as a customer for raw materials and resources in the world, and as ultimately a challenger to United States hegemony in the world. That's what China should be concerned about. And guess what, Mark? China is concerned about it. And my advice to the United States is very clear. The days when China could be ordered what to do by foreign countries is gone and gone forever. Thanks, Mark, in Glasgow for that call. We're talking about that very subject. What should China be concerned about in this new shift in U.S policy towards the Asia-Pacific region. And we're asking, should the world be celebrating the nuclear peace deal that has been reached between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the permanent five plus one? Paul has a point of view on the former, and he's in Libya. Paul, welcome to the show. Hello? Yes, go on, you're on the air. Yeah, good evening. Good evening to you, sir. Go on. Yeah, I want to talk about China and America. I want to ask a question about America. Yeah. Why is it that America is always on people's affairs? There are no more than when they have problems with Cuba the other time. There is no other foreign power that is there. No other country that is involved. But now these two people, they are their brothers, they have their problem. Why America will come in? Instead of making peace, what is, what is all about this United Nation in the world? Is well, uh, I, I, didn't, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't, Paul, catch all or even most of that. But I did catch the last bit. Don Ki Moon, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, is a complete bystander in all of these questions. He's a bystander on the solution to the Syria question. This was brokered by Russian diplomacy and by diplomacy now involving Russia, the United States, Iran, and other powers. And the Iran deal was done directly, bilaterally in the first instance, and probably in secret in the first instance, directly between the United States and Iran. The United Nations has never looked more redundant Let's go to Tehran, see what the view is from there. Fahim is on the line in Tehran. Fahim, welcome to the show. Uh, good evening, Mr. Galloway. It's very nice to talk to you once again after a while on Iron Press TV. Thank you. Um, um, to tell you about the negotiations, I always said that the negotiation you know, between Iran and the world powers showed the righteousness of the Iranian nation. For sure, the deal was a victory for Iran. And uh, the, Iranian, the Iranian delegation obviously managed to prove the country's rights in talks with the I know six top world powers and proved that Iran would not back down from the core of its rights and interests. I hope these initial agreements will serve as a step towards resolving the current problems and efforts will be made to lift the uh, you know, unjust and unilateral sanctions. I mean, not just unilateral sanctions, but all sanctions imposed on uh, the country. This is one of the implications I can get, you know, obviously from uh, these talks. You know. uh, no one can deny that there was no pressure, including the economic ones, you know, on Iranian. Yes, there was pressure. But uh, as the president, I mean, President Rouhani mentioned the other day on TV, the sanctions were not the only reasons, you know, why Iran was willing to put an end to these conflicts. You know, for sure, uh, we are going to use, uh, we are going to use, you know, the uh, nuclear uh, energy for peaceful purposes, you know, for, uh, you know, medical issues and uh, lots of scientific issues as well. Um, however, the fortunately, of course, the economic condition is in the country is getting better and better. Uh, very short, Mr. Galloway, but I suppose that uh, there might be a problem in this process. I mean, these, uh, you know, very long, period, uh, longer, you know, process. And uh, that is the Zionist lobby of the United States in the Middle East, you know. Uh, indeed, Israel would put pressure on the United States, on the U.S. government, 
to distract the deals between Iran and the world powers. Actually, this is my point of view. Uh, I've got a question for you, Mr. Galloway, if possible. What do you think about the role of the Zionist regime in talks? Do you think that uh, this will have some problems? They will, uh, will have some uh, no, negative uh, problems? No, uh, uh, I think it, uh, that was an excellent call. I don't disagree uh, with any of what you said. Uh, but I have to make this point. The, for all the wealth and power of Israel's lobby in the United States, which I reiterate for the nth time, is not a Jewish lobby. It's not the same thing as a Jewish lobby. Most of Israel's friends in the United States are not Jewish, and most of them don't even like Jews. The Christian, fanatic, evangelical tens of millions of the religious right in the United States are Israel's biggest supporters, even though there are not many Jews in their country clubs, in their golf clubs. For all that wealth and power, Netanyahu ranted and raved. He beat his chest. He rattled the windows and the doors of the White House, but he was unable to stop the United States doing this deal with Iran. And Reuters, Ipsos, have just produced a very interesting opinion poll, which showed that the great majority of American people, something like 66%, are not prepared to be involved in any further Middle East wars. But when asked the question, do you think the United States needs to guarantee the security of what they call Israel, 50% said yes. Now you might think that's a very high figure, but 10 or 20 years ago that figure would have been closer to 100%. So not even a majority, just 50%, exactly half of the people polled, and it was a very big poll, consider that the United States has a responsibility to guarantee Israel's security. If I was Netanyahu, I'd be afraid, very afraid, of the collapsing position of public opinion in the United States and around the world in relationship to the settler state. Some breaking news, there's been a car bomb near a bus stop in Damascus, and reports say that over three dozen, no, over a dozen, so more than 12 people have been killed. Stay tuned and we'll bring you up to date on that. That's more than a dozen people have been killed, reportedly, after a car bomb exploded at a bus stop in Damascus. I had a conversation earlier today with Mother Agnes Mariam of the Cross, of the Diocese of Homs, Hama, and Yabrud, and she made the point that although the war has been lost, by the fanatics in Syria. Although the world is headed to Geneva too for a negotiated end to the conflict in Syria, that the very possibility of peace has caused the recrudescence, her word, of fanatic takfiri extremism, and that great violence would still, if they could, be visited by them upon the society and the people of Syria. And no sooner had she spoken that this car bomb exploded at a bus stop in Damascus. And it will not be, of course, the last. We are asking tonight, what does the Iran deal mean for world peace? Celebrated everywhere in the world, except in the tyranny of Saudi Arabia and the settler state that they call Israel. And what an unholy alliance those two have now struck. Imagine, these medieval tyrants have joined hands with the occupier of Al-Aqsa. The so-called guardians of the two holy mosques in Mecca, the so-called protectors of the holiest places in Islam, are now in open alliance over Iran with the occupiers of Al-Aqsa, the third holiest shrine in Islam. 
You really couldn't make that up, but you don't have to. It's already happening in real life. And we'll be asking, what should China be concerned about as the United States switches its emphasis to the Asia Pacific? God willing, I'll be back with the second half of the show right after the news. Welcome back to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. We are asking on the big conversation in the great debate this evening, what does the Iran deal mean for world peace? And what should China be concerned about in the US's new turn to the Asia Pacific? We're taking calls, texts and emails from all over the world on these two vitally important subjects. In the whole of the world, there were only two countries that did not welcome the peace deal with Iran, which brings an end to most of the crippling sanctions that have not brought Iran to its knees because Iran never ended on its knees, but gravely hurt and affected badly the ordinary family in Iran. Uh, The sanctions are to be lifted. Iran has reached agreement with the world powers on how it will proceed, not why or if, but how it will proceed to implement its inalienable lawful right to develop peaceful nuclear energy. Only two countries in the whole world refused to welcome the deal. Indeed, both of them denounced it. In London today, imagine the ambassador of what they call Saudi Arabia denounced the agreement as appeasement. He was chosen by the barbarians who run that country to make that statement in London because of course appeasement is about the gravest charge that can be made in this country. Recalling as it does the quislings in England in power in the 1930s and their appeasement of Hitlerism. And if not for the rise of Mr. Churchill and the defenestration of the previous Prime Minister, Mr. Chamberlain, then the appeasers would have done a deal with Hitler and I'd be speaking to you tonight in German. So they chose their ambassador in London to deliver this grave insult to the people of the world who overwhelmingly welcome the deal. Mahmoud is in Sweden. Let's see if he welcomes it. Mahmoud, welcome to the show. Mahmoud, you're on the air. Uh, hello, good evening. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, there's no uh, celebration for that uh, treaty which was done in uh, Vienna for various reasons, George. Uh, I think you can hear that Netanyahu has, is barking like a toothless dog. And that's not the end of the story. As soon... If it's not a good deal, Mahmoud, the... why, why, why do Israel and Saudi Arabia hate the deal so much? Usually if they hate yes. something, it probably means it's worth liking. Yeah, nobody likes them, but they are very sad. They will be successful. This Zionist lobby in Washington... And Wahhabi lobbies working together. Uh, if this peace treaty pass uh, six months, it's okay. Let's hold on our breath. But I don't believe it will continue up to six months. Something somewhere will click there in Washington, and will be two square one again. No, and you're, rest, you're look. It was in Geneva, rest, not in rest. Vienna. But you're not just wrong about the geography, Mahmoud. And I told you this last week. It's not good enough for you in Sweden or me in London to want to fight to the last drop of Iranian blood. It's not good enough for you in Sweden or me in London to demand that Iran should endure forever sanctions. If Iran and its government and its leadership decided 
that this was a deal they could do, then if you're really a friend of Iran, you should support it. That's just my point of view. But thanks for the call. Ali is in Manchester. Let's hear what Ali thinks about it. Go ahead, Ali. Hello, George. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, the, you know, the deal or, you know, they get into a deal now at the early stages. Yeah. Um, the United States, do you think, has it shifted, you know, a new alliance, you know, because, you know, if we go back to the, you know, the Shah era and, you know, then Saddam and, you know, the consequences after that. Do you think they are looking for a new ally in the Middle East and maybe Iran well, uh, is the uh, new one or is that far-fetched? I think it's far-fetched, uh, Ali. I mean, right. the, the Iran is not going to change its character. It's going to be the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's not going to abandon the Palestinian people. It's not going to abandon the Lebanese resistance. It's not going to abandon the Syrian Arab Republic. It's not going to change its attitude to the settler state that they call Israel. That doesn't much sound like uh, a, a partner uh, or an ally of the United States in the region, does it? No. Um, you know, the way I see it, um, I don't, you know, I've been reading a lot of David Attaway lately. Um, and, you know, he explains how, you know, the special relationship between Saudi and, you know, the United States was never like a, a you know, a special relationship. It was, a, it was more of, you know, the Americans wanting, you know, to have a relationship with Saudi where Saudis, you know, they were on the mindset that we don't actually need America. You know, we have the, the oil. We can sell it to Asia. You know, we don't have to sell it to America. And, you know, we can control our own, you know, our own, you know, internal security, um, especially, you know, with their influence with, the, you know, the, the Wahhabi sect. Um, you know, how does all that, you know, reflect within, you know, well, I think you know, that, the US? Well, I, I, I said earlier, I think the most significant thing out of all this is that the United States and Britain uh, and the other big powers have said very clearly that actually they don't care what Saudi Arabia thinks. They don't care what Israel thinks. They think that a deal with Iran is good for them. The United States has other fish to fry, as we're talking about on this show. The United States does not depend on oil from Saudi Arabia. And only 50% of the people of the United States think that the United States has any responsibility to Israel. President Obama hates Netanyahu. And Netanyahu hates him. And each of them knows it. So the really significant strategic shift emerging in just the last few weeks, it's amazing how fast these things now move, is that a strategic shift has occurred whereby with all their money the Saudis were ignored. With all their lobbying power the Israelis were ignored. That's the really important new duality that comes out of this whole business. Ali in Manchester as always. Thanks for the call. Uh, shall we go to Libya again? Chi Gioki in Libya. Welcome to yes, the show. Yes, go ahead. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the issue, the truth is that um, uh, America has to ignore Israel and the Saudi Arabia. Why would it be? They are sick and tired of going to war. They have gone to war. Afghanistan. Well, Libya, Saudi Arabia is not Syria, going to war, Iran. brother. Saudi Arabia <laughs> couldn't fight its way out of a paper bag. However many hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons it has, uh, it has uh, purchased as a kind of uh, cycle of bribery and corruption of the Faustian pact which it has with Western countries. Saudi Arabia is not going to go to war with anybody. Yeah, well, the, the, the truth is that uh, America, needs, America needs the, the money. They, they need to take this weapon to them and they get their money. That is number one truth. What I'm trying to say in the issue of uh, Israel and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, they merge together. They have, they have one thing in common. They have, they have Lebanon. The truth is that Israel uh, is worried that, not about nuclear Iran. He's worried about Hezbollah. Hezbollah is getting more stronger, more powerful. 
since they have engaged themselves in war in Syria. The table turned. The uh, Syrian army started doing well. They began to take, they began to take uh, territories. Okay, and brother, thanks for that call. I'm going to stay in Libya and go to Abdullah in Libya. We're well watched in Libya these days. Abdullah, welcome to the show. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Dallari. Good evening to you, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to start from the one call from Libya right now. That, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, what am I going? My word is going to be based on advice. My advice is that uh, we all know that Saudi Arabia, they have a lot of money. And my advice is that we wish that the Saudi Arabia will stop using their money unnecessary way. Realize that in Africa or around the Asia, where well, like Myanmar people, they are Muslims and they need the help. Yes, of course. And by the way, Abdullah, we, we need to at this point make clear, as I always try to do, when I'm denouncing Saudi Arabia, I'm denouncing their rulers, their leaders who were not chosen by them, but imposed upon them and who remain in power by force. We're not talking about the decent, God-fearing masses in Arabia. We are not talking about the genuine Muslim people of Arabia. We're talking about the kleptocrats who rule them. Let's go to Minnesota, a place I know well, and talk to Abdi. Abdi, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Welcome, sir. Yes, um, I just wanted to say that uh, the agreement uh, in Geneva over the weekend uh, is certainly uh, positive um, in the world. Uh, diplomacy is always better than conflict. Um, you know, what I'm looking at and what I'm seeing is really how Syria um, is, you know, is still having this problem in the Middle East and how Iran really is the only country standing up for it. What's happening in that country is completely illegal. Um, you know, over here in the United States, a lot of people read the news and the way they're told is these are rebels. And in my personal opinion, these are state trained and state armed terrorists who are sent to Syria by Saudi Arabia. Um, and basically told to fight there against another nation, which in my opinion is completely illegal. But the way they're portrayed in the news and the media is they're rebels. They're uh, people who want a revolution. Mm. The other thing is... after. But the Abdi, way, uh, uh, Abdi yeah. let me interrupt you. Uh, the vast majority, I mean more than two-thirds, of the people of the United States, despite the fog of war propaganda, are absolutely opposed to the United States going to war either with Iran or Syria. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the way that uh, Israel is currently acting after the deal has been signed is absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, the, the way I see it, a lot of these issues that have been avoided, like going to war with Syria, is partly due to this global consciousness where people are becoming more and more aware of what's going on. They're keeping up to date. A lot of people in the United States refuse to go to war. They didn't want such things. And, you know, I, I specifically you were talking about Saudi Arabia and Israel and the unholy alliance. And I completely agree with that. Um, currently, now they've become more coordinated than before. Before, you had um, last year, or actually this year, where Israel was bombing uh, Syria under the pretense of they're supporting terrorists or these weapons were going to terrorists. And then you had Saudi Arabia just sending men and arming people going to that country. But after the deal has been signed with Iran, now they're more coordinated and working with each other. And that's really um, something to keep an eye on as well. Well, that's true. And uh, Abdi, I described it earlier as the unholiest alliance probably ever seen in modern political history. The head-chopping, hand-chopping, medieval tyrants of the House of Saud in open alliance with the Israeli occupier of the Al-Aqsa and of Holy Jerusalem. In open alliance. Bandar, Prince Bandar Bush, is openly boasting in the international media about the new era of cooperation between the custodians of the two mosques and the occupiers of Al-Aqsa. You couldn't make it up, Abdi, but as I said earlier, you don't have to because it's actually happening in front of our eyes. No 
one thing that I would tell everyone around the world is, you know, keep an eye on this. Uh, be active. Um, be aware. I, I, even if it's not in your country, this is something that everyone should know. We are all citizens of the world. Every, if someone has a problem across the world, it's our problem. That's all I had to say. Well, it was more than enough. Abdi in Minnesota, great call. Let's go to Samuel in Paris. What should China be concerned about, Samuel? Go on, Samuel, you're on the air, but you need to turn your television down. Okay, the television is down. Okay, go ahead. I want to speak on the issue of America and China. And, uh, welcome, America welcome. America is trying to be one of the most dangerous countries on the surface of the earth, you know, because America is getting involved in all of the problems in this war, around the war, and as Louis Farrakhan says, that America's foreign policy is very, very dangerous, and the American people need to know that, you know. Yes. Concerning the issue of China, China is trying to resolve a problem around the world. Even if, even if China declared a, a, a non-safe zone, America has no right to, to fly two B-52 on that country without China's consent. If this is was America's concern, and anybody who tries to fly up a, a military flight under that particular zone, we should have been t uh, talking different thing by now. But well, uh, they're, they're taking a big risk. That, that's a direct challenge to China's integrity then. Well, they're taking a very big risk, uh, Samuel, uh, and the risk is much more serious than China shooting their B-52s down out of the air, which I assure you China is more than capable of doing. But actually, China would be more likely to respond in a much more devastating way, simply announcing some evening in the near future that it has decided to move out of dollars and into, for example, the euro or into something else. This would bring the United States economy crumbling to the floor by the time the markets opened in the morning. So my advice, President Obama, is don't try and bully China because China is more than capable of standing up to you. Let's go to Mohammed in Oman on the subject of Iran. Mohammed, uh, Oman was one of the only countries in the GCC to openly welcome the deal with Iran. Zahra, it looks to you. Uh, of course, Mr. George Galloway, as an Omani citizen, I would say we Omanis enjoying the news of the Iran nuclear deal. We want peace in the Middle East. We want e uh, peace in the Arab uh, Persian Gulf. We don't want many wars here. The thing I don't understand uh, the rant and the whinging coming from our neighboring countries accusing us of helping Iran. Iran is our neighbor, so is the rest of the Gulf uh, uh, region, uh, as a uh, uh, state. Uh, His Majesty the Sultan uh, of Oman played the role. This is not the first time to play the role as a peace man or as a peace uh, uh, maker. Uh, this has happened before between Iraq and Iran. Okay, and uh, during the invasion of uh, uh, Kuwait and uh, with the war in, in, in Yemen. We are very proud of this deal, and our country played a really, really great part in this. And I was just reading the news now that the Iranian, the Iranian Majlis Speaker will visit Oman uh, uh, by next week, and also the Foreign um, Minister as well. Amin, Mohammed, Amin in Oman, talking about the role that his country played and the criticism that it has now been on the receiving end of from countries that are barking, though the caravan has moved on, Mohammed. And Oman is on board that caravan, as are most of the people in the world who want peace in the region, who want justice in the region, who know that if there's no justice, there will be no peace. So, we're talking about China. We're talking about the peace deal that was reached in Geneva. And we're talking indirectly about the peace deal to come. The one that begins on, I think, the 22nd of January in the talks in Geneva on the Syrian war. Because all of these issues are, of course, connected. Mohammed's on the line to talk about them. He's in Tehran. Mohammed, welcome to the show. Mohammed, go ahead. You're on the air. Yes, yes, yes. I am ready. Yes, go on. 
Hello, George. Yes, Mohammed, you're on the air. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, George, I want to talk about the sanction in Iran. I, wa I want to talk. Uh, do you have my voice? Yes, please go ahead, sir. Uh, I want to talk about sanction in Iran that it is accepted from the United States on us. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mohammed, that's been a bit of a disaster of a call all round. My apologies if that's our system, but I suspect it may have been your telephone that was at fault. Mohammed in Tehran was talking about these sanctions. These are sanctions that have really hurt ordinary people, that have devastated the currency value in Iran, that have made it very difficult for essential goods and services to be imported and very difficult for Iran to sell its exports abroad that have frozen Iran largely out of the international banking system, that have led, for example, to Press TV being taken off the air in Britain as a result of a bogus Ofcom complaint, which everybody knows, and WikiLeaks told us in advance, was actually a part of the sanctions on Iran. And perhaps most importantly, these sanctions froze billions and billions of dollars of Iran's wealth that belongs to the Iranian people and could and should have been used for the benefit of the Iranian people, but were frozen in Western banks and other institutions. This will all now be lifted. A new future beckons. The Iran deal is not just good for Iran. It's good for the region and it's good for the world. The world economy will benefit from the new kickstart of Iranian economic demand. For example, Peugeot, Citroën in France, which has laid off hundreds, maybe thousands of workers since these sanctions stopped them from selling their cars and parts and other prefabricated systems to Iran because the French government wouldn't allow them to. Now Peugeot Citroen will be able to sell, although Iran might decide to look for another motor car manufacturing partner given the attitude struck by the French president who tried, of course, to scupper this deal. But whoever Iran decides to shop with will, of course, spark demand in the international economy. It will take the tension, the fear of war, out of international affairs, at least in the Persian Gulf. The dogs in the House of Saud and in the House of Netanyahu are barking, but the caravan has decisively moved on as has the caravan that can lead to a negotiated settlement in the war in Syria. The caravan of justice and peace, in the end, will not be stopped. It will continue, however many dogs are barking at its wheels. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. Hello, if you comment, name on the page, you can number. And just make sure you your telephone number. Zero, zero. Can you spell your name for me? Yeah, I know, I know. You need to your phone number. And then we'll be back. Can I have your telephone number? Okay, so I'll be back. I'll be back